Hey guys, welcome to episode 66 of Dating Skills Podcast. I'm your host, Angel Donovan. How do you keep your marriage alive? How do you keep a long-term relationship alive? Is it possible to have a relationship that's alive in five years, 10 years, 20 years, as it was the first week? We looked at reasons why choosing marriage may be right or wrong for you with Alex Allman way back in uh, episode 43. So it might be useful for you to go back and check that out. Listen to that episode before you start this one, if you missed it. So what we're talking about today is a pretty relevant topic to the times. We all have this feeling that relationships and marriages don't really last as long as they used to. But is it true? Well, when I did a bit of research and background checkup for this episode, as always, the subject was pretty confused in the news. And even in like some of the government reports, it wasn't very straight. For instance, like some of them say that Since the 1980s, divorce has dropped. Now that's looking at pure numbers. So yeah, that's true. Divorce numbers have dropped, but it's mostly because less people are getting married now also. So when you actually look at the sums, the number of people getting married over time has dropped quicker than the number of people getting divorced over time, which means that the rate of divorce has been increasing. More people, they get married, get divorced over time. So, you know, most marriages last around eight years now which isn't the end of the world. You know, it's better than a lot of the celebrity rates you read in the press, but that's not the 10 years that people kind of aim for at least or or longer or lifelong. So today we're looking at how to make relationships sustainable over the long term. In particular, we're looking at some of the biggest challenges that come up and how to tackle them. Some of what we discuss is relevant to anyone interested in relationships. So if you're not married or in a long-term relationship yet, don't check out just yet. It's all good things to keep in mind that we're going to be talking about today, just as you're starting a relationship or as a relationship is developing. Today's guest is Afol K, a guy who will have been married for 20 years as of November 2014. Afol has a very popular blog and book named Married Man Sex Life that looks specifically at the reasons men's relationships with women don't last over time and they tend to dry out. And in particular, the women tend to get less interested and the whole vibe of the relationship just kind of goes sour and eventually reaches a crisis. So Afol developed his ideas mostly from pickup artists when he was reading about this in 2009. Um, But over time, he's also looked at other sources and integrated those into his thinking. So he's been able to introduce married men to ideas that they typically wouldn't have come across in the traditional marriage and relationship books you find in bookstores. Now, I have a quick uh, interview correction here because we were talking about Afol's sex life in the interview and we were talking about how over 16 years he and his wife slept together 5,000 times. And I wrongly made some quick calculations on that. So I said that that translates to eight times per week, 35 times per month and over one time per day. Um, he pushed back on me and he said, oh, I don't think it's that. And it turns out he was right. I looked at it again and it's actually six times per week, roughly 25 times per month and just less than one time per day. So that's the correction for this week. Like to get our facts straight. To get the show notes, to get the transcript of the show and the MP3 download of the interview, go to datingskillsreview.com slash DSP66. I'm Angel Donovan, and this is the Dating Skills Podcast. This is a 14-year ongoing mission to discover the truth about what works in dating, sex, and relationships, to become a better man. Join me as I leave no stone unturned. Chase down every expert, role model, and mentor with insights to get us to that goal as fast as possible. This show is about bringing you the best of that information so that you can take it in and change your life for the better, step by step, episode by episode. Afol, it's great to have you on the podcast. I got a question for you. Where exactly do people think you come from? Mostly, if people are confused, they think I'm from Australia, but I am, in fact, from New Zealand, the smaller, more attractive country of the two, and born and raised there until 1994. And then I came to the United States and married my wife, Jennifer. I've been here ever since. That's a long time, and you haven't at all distorted your accent by the sounds of it. It comes and goes. A lot of it depends who I ended up talking to as well. It softens when I'm here, but if I talk to my my mother or my sister or whatever, it sort of tends to lapse back. Well, you're going to probably hate me for this, but most people seem to think I'm Australian or New Zealand when they meet me. Really? I actually picked a 
slight sense of English. There you go. <laughs> Someone who actually knows. I was born a long time ago in England. <laughs> yeah, but for some reason they think I'm out from where you are. Well, that's a long time. Yeah, great.、Uh, you must be enjoying it over there in the US. I am. It's actually not wildly different from New Zealand. There are more differences inside the countries than I think across them. I think any of the Western English-speaking countries. Are all vaguely the same. It's not like you would move to England or Australia or New Zealand or Canada and be completely lost. There's more differences inside the countries. But yeah, been in Connecticut for nearly 20 years now. Wow, wow, that's just two lifetimes. So, how did you get into this relationship advice stuff? You ended up in Connecticut, and then and then what happened? We had a normal, regular life. Now,、um, went on for a very long time with a very, very happy, content marriage. Now,、um, about. Thirteen or fourteen years into it, I had a a vague sense of discontent and started feeling at times attracted to other people. But at the same time, nothing objectively that I could see that Jennifer was doing was wrong. It wasn't like she was being offensive or rude or bitchy, or we were still having sex all the time. And it was just sort of weird. And I actually ended up being on a forum called. Um, talk about marriage in 2009, and basically just started shuffling through all these stories of you know different things happening to different people, and, and at the same time I ended up sort of poking around on various pickup artist forums and blogs and reading up on it, and to my surprise, I found a lot of the pickup artisty stuff was actually working really well in terms of fixing some of these things and guys. Marriages that I was reading on talk about marriage. Just some of the real basic, you know, the guy just got so incredibly basic, couldn't stand up for himself. Applying some of that knowledge seemed to really, really work. And I had the sense of、uh, I've actually sort of found something here that is important. I kept saying the same stuff over and over again on the talk about marriage forum. At some point, it's like well, I need to start my own blog. I got to you know end up writing a book to sort of codify the information so that it's out there. And then one thing leads to another, and here I am. It's about you know five years later. So how old are you now, and how long you've been married? I'm forty four, and we're coming up to our twentieth anniversary in three months. Nice, congratulations. Which one's that? That's like a bronze or something, right? Um, <laughs> I, you should know. <laughs> Maybe it's a weird color, like purple or something. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I have no clue. All right, all right. Maybe it's something you <laughs> want to check out before you get there. <laughs> I just saved your life. Yeah. How many dates have you had in your life? Oh, dates. And you mean with her after we were married, or before, or anyone in general? Ah,、uh, I guess before, or however you want to answer it. Like this is the first time we had someone who's been married as long as you. It's an exclusive marriage, right? Yeah. We, I mean, in terms of Jennifer and myself, we didn't actually date before we got married. At all, we had a somewhat a strange arrangement where I had come and worked on a summer camp in 1991. So I was 21, and figured, well, I'm in New Zealand. I just do not want to get involved with anyone else because then you just start these stupid long distance relationships that go nowhere. So I very dutifully avoided emotional entanglements with anyone while I was here. And then nine days before I was due to go back to New Zealand. I met Jennifer, and we hit it off really, really well. She was initially dating somebody else at that time. I didn't quite like him. I said she looked unhappy with him. She dumped him, and then we basically got to spend the last four days I was in the states hanging out together. And then I went back to New Zealand. Didn't think much of anything would come of it. She contacted me a couple months later, and then it's like, well, if we need to be, if we're going to figure out how to be together, we end up. We got to be in the same country somehow. So the reality is, if someone's going to switch countries to be with someone, that's a big commitment. You're not just going to do that at random. So we actually started talking about getting married relatively early in the process. We spent a total of three years doing a combination of long distance and visit. How often did you see each other over that time? We visited each other over the Christmas period. Twice, so I came out here for about seven and a half weeks. She came to New Zealand for three and a half. So, like once per year in one big chunk. Pretty much.、Mm. And then the whole of the rest of the time, 
For guys out there, if you're doing long distance relationships, um, how did you do that? Is, is that Skype a lot or what is that? No, this was, you got to remember, this is back in the early 90s. Oh, right. There is no Skype. There is no internet. There is. Wow. And even then, even then, phone calls were a couple of bucks a minute. So we did those for sort of hmm. critical points. We wrote a crap ton of letters to each other, which would then take five to nine days to actually arrive in the mail. So what kept you focused on this long distance relationship, which was a lot more complex versus saying, look, I should just get back to where I am and make a life here? There was just something about it that I was particularly interested in and liked. And don't get me wrong, it, just, it certainly got harder the longer it went on. I mean, the first year was, was fine. Then you get to see each other and the second year is much harder. Did you find you had a lot of arguments or there was a lot kind of tension just because of the situation? Not so much arguments with each other, but just frustration with the situation. That didn't spill out. You got frustration. It could be like financial. It could be anything. It kind of spills into the relationship sometimes. The biggest issue that we had was that our original wedding date was going to be like a July or something, June or July, which was then right after she was finishing her senior year of college. And then she's, at some point she just said, you know, this is all too much because she's planning the whole wedding and all this sort of stuff completely without me. I was incredibly alpha and, and just said, I have no decisions about this. I'm not there. You do it. I don't like lace. I like the color blue. Otherwise, you know, go for it. She actually got one point said, you know, it's, it's too much to get it all done. And she wanted to push the wedding back to November, which I said was fine, but I couldn't go any further back than that because it's incredibly draining. You can be getting on well, you can like each other, but it's just exhausting. So was the marriage because of the visa? It was a pressure thing? or Because you'd spend 10 weeks, 11 weeks together? Yeah, but you can just do that as a tourist. We got married here because we wanted to get married. The, the visa was a whole different thing. So you decided to get married based on the 11 weeks you'd spent together and the three years of long distance relationship? Yeah. Great. And as I understand it, you were virgins when you married? Or did I read that wrong? We were... Technically virgins in terms of what we'd done. We, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> we, we'd had intercourse with each other before we got married, basically when I'd come out the final time before we were getting married. Oh. And before that, we had done, we certainly had sex with each other in terms of hand jobs and mutual masturbation sort of stuff before then. But yeah, basically. Oh, so, but you hadn't slept with other people or anything? So you were no. Kind of, okay. No. Cool. Just coming back to that, I mean, that's an, it's an actually an interesting thing in terms of, it's a positive thing in terms of, in a sense, I mean, we we're both quite religious at that point of our lives, and we were kind of breaking the rules to be with each other doing even what we were doing. Doesn't everyone break the rules these days in that respect? Pretty much. Pretty much. But this is 20 years ago, so we were kind of breaking sure. the rules. Yeah, I have, to keep, I have to keep transporting myself <laughs> back 20 years. Okay, all right. But the benefit in terms of the relationship is that we're still each other's firsts, and we still that... That is a positive. I mean, basically comprise each other's sexual history. So it's, it's good in that sense. Great. And uh, another thing I read was you had sex 5,000 times in the first 16 years. And we basically continued that. So that's, eight, just for everyone at home, that's eight times per week, 35 times per month. These are all averages. <laughs> no, I don't think it's quite eight times per week. Yeah. Are you sure I did the sums? 16 times uh, <laughs> 365 I was interested, <laughs> so I did the sum. So I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty good at maths. I was in finance before. So I don't know, maybe I'm wrong and Excel's wrong, but, and it's 1.1 times per day. Anyway, that's a lot. It's not quite that much. I got, basically for us, we've basically had this situation where we got on really, really well at the beginning of our marriage. We were basically went at it at a pretty frequent rate. And that just sort of became the normal for us. So in a sense, when we go to bed, we have a, almost a, just a default assumption that we're going to do something sexual with each other, unless there's a reason not to. Like someone is truly exhausted, someone's sick. With Jennifer's second pregnancy, she was basically on bed rest for the last you know five months, so we didn't get to do a whole lot of anything then. But basically, we've had this default assumption that we would do something. So it's not even like we've set out and said, okay, well, let's rack up some huge number, but it just becomes the normal for us. It becomes the default setting. And that's actually been really, really helpful for us because it just assumes we're going to do something that we will connect rather than lapsing into some sort of, you know. Are you both of you initiating this or? Primarily it's me, but also, I mean, this, 
it's almost like the initiation is going to be in the sense of we will you know, plan to do something. In terms of what we do, it's by far me initiating more than her in terms of that actual, let's do this, let's do that. Great. All right. Well, we all know sex is good for relationships, so that must be helping a lot. Yep. So you're very well known for advice for married men. Do you think marriage is different to any other very long-term relationship? I do. One, I think there's a higher, more serious degree of commitment, I think. But also the big thing that's truly different is this is a legal agreement. And the legalities of the situation can be incredibly serious, especially when it comes to splitting up. Most people get married with very, very little idea of what they're actually agreeing to. You know, I mean, most people get married with the idea of, you know, this is all for for love and forever and then you know everything is happy families and the magic is special to us and nothing bad's really going to happen and you don't actually necessarily know what you fully agreed to until you're getting to the end of it which is when the lawyers show up it's funny the lawyers show up at the end of this relationship rather than the beginning when you're signing the contract so if we walk into a marriage like trying to put this uh, legal side of thing uh, to the side if we have a prenup agreement does that not put a lot of that that side of it to the side it can. It will also depend on which state you're living in and what judge that you get in terms of you know whether they are going to accept it or reject it. Or in Jennifer and myself's case, we had nothing when we got married, so it wasn't like we had assets beforehand that we would have worried about. But it's absolutely a legal contract. So this sounds kind of burdensome. I mean, it doesn't sound like a positive thing we're talking about. How is marriage different to long-term relationships? If you could give a quick, like, quick summary, what's the positives and negatives of it versus a long-term relationship in your mind? The positive of a long-term relationship is that if it is truly going bad, you can extract yourself from it typically more easily than if you're married. So that will depend, again, which state you're living in and whether or not you've hit some magical number of years together that cohabitation law kicks in and they basically treat you like you're married. The positives for marriage is I think it creates that that stable financial construct where you can basically work together, pull your resources, pull your talent, and more consciously create a family. Now, so you can have things like that. You can have you know, access to each other's medical records. And if one of you dies, things get transferred far more easily. That's some of the benefits of it. It's a, if you have to look at it as different from the relationship itself, this financial, legal, economic construct that you're putting together, if it works great, it works really, really, really well. Yeah. Who do you think should, or why should you consider marriage? Say I'm in a pretty long-term relationship. I'm committed to a girl for at least 10 years, foreseeable future. I think for me, the most important reason to be getting married is one that you actually want to spend your time with this person for a considerable period of time and you know, hopefully the remainder of one of your lives and that you're consciously thinking about creating a family. And that's something that just you're looking for to create the financial stable relationship family structure where you can raise kids and then at some point have grandkids and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's the primary reason. But I'm catching the vibe from you too, that is that worry like, oh my God, it is a legal agreement. Is this a friendship with responsibilities instead of fun? There's a lot of people, a lot of my friends these days, they're not considering marriage. They're quite happy to get into very long-term relationships. Of course, there's many people listening to this today who are marriage is definitely for them. So I'm just saying like, there's all kinds of ways to look at it these days and there's all sorts of people. I myself, I have no idea. You know, I'm just like, maybe one day I'll decide to, but you know, it's not in the plan. It's not nothing I'm really thinking about. So I'm sure there's guys out there are just, it's interesting to think of like, yo, you know, should I consider this one day? If it comes up in a relationship, give it a bit more thought. That's what we like to do here. Cause there's a lot of decisions made in society by default because it's what everyone's supposed to do. And I think that's really the worst way to go about it. So a little bit of pre thought helps. And I think that's how a lot of guys stumble onto the issue of whether they should get married or not. They've started looking for someone's phone number, and then they get the phone number, and then they turn that into a date, and then they turn the date into a couple of dates, and then they turn that into a girlfriend, and then that into a long-term relationship. And then they start thinking, should I be married? Do we want to be married? When they've started off just looking for a phone number. She had symmetrical breasts and a phone number. It, it was all green. 
I think you're right where people start at one end and then they, they start thinking about it deep into the situation. I think that's common too. Do you think there are scenarios where it's better for you? Say, well, if you take the guy, you know, his situation. Do you think there's scenarios, types of guys or particular situations they're in where they shouldn't consider marriage, where it's probably not the best thing for them? In terms of the guy himself or who he's getting involved with? I mean, I'd like to discuss both, you know, maybe the woman he's interested in getting married with isn't the ideal or the ideal situation either. I think there's an element of truth to the fact that there seem to be some people who are a little more genetically predisposed to variety and novelty and shorter-term relationships. And there are some that seem to be a little more predisposed to longer-term, stable relationships. You can see that in different people too, where one type of person is far more high-stimulation-seeking, far more you know, out and about doing stuff, likes doing anything that's potentially fun new, different, that comes along where other people are a whole lot more stable and relaxed, easygoing, whatever. I think if you're in the latter group, then marriage probably comes a little more easily. Whereas if you're in the former group, it's not quite so easy. I mean, it's not impossible, but you'd have to consciously manage, you know, where do I get my stimulation from? I mean, if you're the type of person where you've had sex with someone, you know, three or four times and you're like, well, I'm bored, where's the next one? then I think that would sort of suggest that maybe marriage is not for you. Is that a biological uh, scenario or is that kind of something learned? I think it's both. There are some people, though, that definitely respond, have a high degree of craving for variety and just doing different things with different people. Yeah. And I think there's a lot you can do in one relationship in terms of variety. And I think... A lot of the people in that situation, if it's really just four times, if we're talking like maybe a few months, then I think the biological thing can come into it more. However, if it's really just a few times, I think the problem is really that they're not putting enough effort in to create a great sexual experience for themselves and the girl at the same time, of course. So that's kind of why I'd stand on that. I don't know if you agree on that. I think you have to look at the pattern of what you do. I think if someone has had... And this applies to both men and women. If someone's had a whole string of very short-term relationships, one-night stands, I think that's a pattern where you can say, okay, this is someone that's not probably orientated towards wanting to be in longer-term relationships, where you see someone else that hunts for something that will then turn into a longer-term relationship, so that even if they've had you know, very short-term relationships, they're still actively hunting for the longer ones. But you can see some some pattern in the history of longer-term relationships. I think they, they lean that way more. You can only really look at what they've done and see if you can pick some sort of pattern from it. But ultimately, it's up to the person. Am I ready for this? Do I want this? Do I want this super long-term relationship? Well, that sounds like a lot of the things you've come up around the theme of uh, stability. So if you're someone who wants more stability and structure in your life, marriage is probably going to be a more rewarding scenario versus someone who's got a life that's changing up a lot. They like the diversity. They like to, it's in their nature to always look for new things. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's the case. And it's not that it's the case of married people are, are, are tired, reserved, and, and boring. It's that there's a certain need of a variety, but they can get that from that one person. I have a friend and he got married a, a few years back and he'd been a guy who dated multiple women for a long, long, long time. And his marriage lasted about a year or two years, which is, you know, it's pretty short. I was even pretty surprised myself because it was kind of a big deal of him getting married. But on the other hand, having understood his lifestyle before, I was wondering at the same time when he got married, whether he was going to be able to break free of that habit, the way that his life, and I thought it'd be really tough. And, you know, he didn't make it. So I think there's a lot of an experiential thing as well. It might take you might be able to make the change if you go through an adjustment period, like you slow down for a while, have a few shorter relationships, and it kind of is some kind of like transition. If you can see someone who's gone through some kind of transition like that, it's probably got more hope of being sustainable than, than not. Yeah, I mean, some of it's just basic maturity, but I think even then, even as a young kid, you kind of knew who the, the bad boy types were that weren't going to be able to control their, their self throughout the rest of their life and who were going to be the, the calmer, more stable ones. So some of that initial way we are doesn't change all that much. The kids that were basically nice at you know, elementary school grew up and to be basically nice people. And the rat bastards you didn't want to hang out with grew up that way too. 
So I think it's looking for that and knowing which one you are and what you best respond to and what you like. And I think that's part of it. All right. So as I'm looking at the kind of the, the area you've been looking at mostly, it's kind of like 10 year long relationships, basically marriage and other really long relationships. And where does problems coming up down the road where it was good to start with? Something happened a few years in or many years in. Is that the typical scenarios you're looking at all the time? There's a whole lot of that. There's a combination of what we'd call just basic, especially for the guys, basic just sort of betaization where they give away all the things that were kind of naturally attractive and alpha about themselves. Okay, let's just define beta and alpha quickly. Okay, I define them almost slightly differently than probably most people that write about this stuff do. To me, and most people see them on a continuum where there's alpha at one end and beta at the other. I really see them as two completely separate traits. And I really tie the alpha traits into anything that will generate attraction in the opposite sex. And and by which I mean in specific, it's going to trigger some sort of dopamine reaction in them. So they're going to get that hit of the neurotransmitter dopamine. That's the whole thing of fun, excitement, that whole thing when you're tuned on. You're getting a hit of dopamine anytime you're basically excited, really, really engaged, having a great time. So anything alpha is that. The beta stuff, though, which is basically everything that's going to be about creating relationship comfort, that sense of trust, that sense of intimacy, that sense of I'm safe with this person, and that's the hormone oxytocin-based. There are some things that can be both and some things that are neither. Most people, though, when they start the relationship, they are very, very attractive to their partner. So they're doing things that are alpha. They're looking good. They're dressing good. They're fun to be with. You know, They're having a good time. They're being very, very engaging. They're being flirty. They're doing whatever cool guy thing they do that attracts your attention. And along with that, they can be somewhat better at the beginning. They can be connecting. They can be talking to you, buying the flowers, whatever. So they can kind of have both at the beginning. But as they go on in the relationship, they very, very often start giving away a lot of the things that were alpha. Suddenly, they're not dressing up so nice. They're kind of dressing down a bit. They're working their job real serious, so there's not much time left over to have fun. They gave up their guy hobby. They, get, you know, they don't ride the motorbike anymore. They don't play in their band anymore. They're now sitting at home on Friday nights and doing stuff with the kids, whatever. So they can give away all their alpha stuff and at the same time try increasingly hard to increase the beta stuff seeing almost all the mainstream advice out there is basically be soft, be kind, be sweet, be loving, be beta. So they have the situation where at the beginning, the alpha and beta was kind of balanced. And then 10 years later, there's almost next to no alpha, a crap ton of beta. And then the wife is becoming increasingly disinterested. Why do you think this happens? Why are they dropping the kind of activities you were talking about that are alpha? Um, Some of it is that there are known drops in testosterone on getting into a long-term relationship and the birth of the first child. So that's kind of takes away some of that edgy, aggressive behavior, which from a biological point of view kind of makes sense in that they've found their mate and now they have young, so they don't need to do all that risk-taking behavior to try and get one. They, they now start sort of defending it. So it makes sense in that sense. It's not like the testosterone drops away to nothing either. I mean, that's we're talking a moderate dip. Just in terms of modern times, testosterone has been falling the standards falling. So certainly with age as well, there's decline as well. And as you're saying, there's relationship aspects about being in a relationship, having kids, which influences it also. So, you know, all of those tied together. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the testosterone thing across the whole society is dropping away. That's huge. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever had yours tested or anyone has come to you with tested testosterone levels. No, not me. I'm, I'm, I'm still functional. Okay. Don't, don't, make, don't make me go to the doctor. I won't. No, oh, yeah. this is a fun exercise. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, I've done it. A lot of my buddies have done it. I think every guy should uh, go and get tested, especially if he's in this situation where he's dropping these kinds of activities. And he's also in not as good a mood as he used to be. He's more depressed, not as driven, and things like that. These are all you know, indicators of lower testosterone. So it's an important issue you've brought up there. And, and I think part of it is... The advice that they're given is all to be basically be more beta. Is this where, and they're reading this stuff or where are they getting this from? I think it's just part of the overall culture. 
there's not much male-friendly advice that actually explains this. Almost all of it is, you know, how to be more beta. There's not, it's not like you're going to tune on the TV and watch Dr. Phil and have him say, well, you need to go to the gym and learn to ride your motorbike again. Then you need to talk. What's wrong with you? Buy more flowers. I think that's part of it. Some of it is just demands on your time. There's only so many hours in the day. If you're working a long job, coming home, there's only so much time in the day to get everything done. So I think it creeps up on people slowly but surely. The other thing that I see happening, and that's kind of a general sort of background thing where I see this happening over and over. The other thing that I see happening is some sort of critical moment of neglect or failure or whatever that either goes unrecognized or unresolved at some point. That's interesting. Have you got any examples to help us visualize that a bit more? Scenarios? One of the ones I've seen that's common is some kind of death in someone's family, like if you're, I know, your grandmother dies or your mother dies or whatever, and then you go to the funeral, but your partner doesn't go with you wow. for whatever reason. I bring that one up because I've come across it a number of times, and there could be legitimate reasons of why that was. Today you're talking about a big break of trust. So like I said, yeah, so it's either a break of trust or it's you've screwed up or you just don't feel that your partner cares about you or whatever they can really sort of slowly dig into the relationship a lot. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. The iTunes rank of the show is critical for getting the best guests onto the show. Ranking is largely determined by subscriber count, so more subscribers means better guests. Also, if you've already subscribed, then please leave a rating and review. This also helps increase the iTunes rank. Help me make this podcast the best resource possible for you. To subscribe or rate with one click, go to datingskillsreview.com slash iTunes. So what kind of excuses, say if the guy's doing this, but what kind of things is he saying to himself when he doesn't go to the funeral or whatever big? It was going to cost too much money to get there. I couldn't take the time off work. I had to do this big job thing. So maybe they just didn't understand how important it was. Basically. Or even, and I've seen this happen a number of times, I've even seen the cases where the wife has said, it's okay, I will be fine. Like if someone died in a foreign country, that she's flying back home, whatever. She's actually said, I'll, I'll be okay. It is what it is. I know you can't take the time off work or whatever. But when they actually get there, they lose their shit. When that wave of emotion truly hits, and then they feel all alone. So it's never, it's clear cut oh my God, he was just a jerk. What's wrong with him? There's always some sort of confusion around that where there's some sort of miscommunication or misunderstanding or whatever, but then it goes unresolved. It doesn't get talked through. There's no sort of finish to it. Like it started as an issue and then it just kind of vested. Right. I've seen this happen in relationships quite a bit. I always think of it as like some kind of break of trust, right? They trust you to care about them. They trust you to look after them. And you do something which shows that you can't be trusted to do that, whether it's a funeral or whatever bad thing happens to them, you can't be trusted to do that. And then it's just this lack of trust builds slowly over time and they start looking at other things, smaller things. It kind of builds and and you're looking at through, you're looking for the relationship through a different lens, basically, because you had that little bit of, ah, it's, it's not a bulletproof trust we have here. Whereas most relationships, they start, They should start with this bulletproof trust. We're really a team here. We're going to look after each other and it's all good. Yeah. But even then, some of even the worst ones that happen don't necessarily start off as some sort of breach of trust. It's a miscommunication thing Mm, that then becomes an unwitting breach of trust. Right. It's like an accidental, as you said, it's a miscommunication. Yeah. So have you got any interesting scenarios from that to like make that a bit clearer? Because I know that one comes up too a lot. I can give you the worst one with Jennifer and myself. Excellent. You must know that one well. (laughs) I I do. It took me ages to even sort of process and write about it. Going back four years ago now, it's almost four years, my my father died. And we knew he was going to die. He was, you know, basically passing away from cancer. It It wasn't unexpected. And he died on a Friday. I basically got the news from my mother at like 10 o'clock in the morning. I basically finished off my shift, told my boss that my father had passed away. And it was the weekend before Thanksgiving, so I got three days bereavement. So I finished off my Friday, and then I was going to have the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off as bereavement leave, and then Thursday, Friday was Thanksgiving. So I knew I wasn't coming back for like over a week. 
So I told Jennifer and basically said, I would be okay being by myself. And what I meant was I would be okay being by myself on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. What she thought I meant was I wanted to be by myself to sort of take time, process it by myself and alone and grieve on the Saturday and Sunday. Because I'm actually quite introverted, so I mean, it's not bizarre. She very dutifully gave me lots of space to help me process on the Saturday and Sunday and ship the kids around me. And by the time Sunday night was rolling around, I was just beside myself because I basically felt completely ignored. Here I have, dad died, wife is ignoring me. I mean, I was just absolutely beside myself by the time Sunday night was rolling around. I didn't really figure it out until the Monday morning. We didn't figure out there was this miscommunication. And I'm talking about it in very calm, easy tunes now. I tried to write about that incident about six or seven times over the first two years and couldn't even write about it completely until the end of this, you know, this two years had passed. So how did you resolve it? Or did you? <laughs> I guess you did. Um, there's an element of time heals all wounds, and there is an element of understanding that in that moment, Jennifer wasn't trying to fuck me over. She was simply trying to do what she thought I wanted her to do. So is that belief-based or is that communication? If you know a person, you're just like, well, I'm sure that wasn't the intent. There is still some residual sensitivity in terms of now, in case even anyone dies, I'm like, so what do we do? We, you know, we flowers, we see them, do we whatever? And I'm certainly more sensitive, sensitive to that now than I ever was before. In part, it's understanding that she wasn't trying to be some sort of colossally evil bitch in the moment, that there was, she was genuine. Yeah. So did you talk to her about it straight away, or how did it go down? Oh, I had left the house on, basically went out by myself on Sunday night and took space from her and was simmering mad and flipping between being extremely angry and just being extremely upset. And we basically sat together for about two hours on Sunday night. I couldn't even talk to her. And then woke up Monday morning a little more open and then tried to figure out what it was. When I'm really upset, I tend to really just completely shut down and be nonverbal. But yeah, no, it was awful. But it's a miscommunication thing. That could easily have ended things if we hadn't have forced our way to talking about it at some point in terms of what the actual issue was. So some of the pain still lasted, but at least we understood it wasn't. So did you bring it up? Oh, yeah. Because some guys, I think, they're out there, and there's this thing about guys. We don't want to accept that we have weaknesses, we have vulnerabilities, we get upset sometimes, and something like this kind of delicate situation could really upset us in a big way. So how did you bring that up? How did you bring it up? Do you think you brought it up the wrong way or the right way? Or I think I had just asked her to explain why she had ignored me over that Saturday and Sunday. And your answer was why you told me you wanted space. <laughs> and then it's at that point we look at each other like, oh, well, I guess we don't have telepathy to understand what each other wants. We tend to have a, be very, very much in sync and in tune and understanding what each other wants. It's just that. When there is miscommunication, it can be colossal. I think it's a good rule of thumb when there's some kind of misunderstanding. When basically you're upset about something is to think, all right, it's time to clarify. Because often it, there's so many misunderstandings that go down. Well, the thing with miscommunication is that you don't actually get a message that you miscommunicated because that's what miscommunication means. You think you understand what they wanted. They think you understand what they wanted. And... You're not even on the same page. You're completely at odds or whatever, and you don't figure it out that there's a miscommunication until the situation explodes. Okay. We looked at <laughs> two areas. Uh, <laughs> we looked at the, the two challenges you've seen come across for men, which is over it's a slow decline over time. I think we can kind of call that of being less alpha or whatever you want to call it. And then there's this breach of trust. So these are the two big ones. Like, how do you fix these things? What are the main challenges to fix both of these areas? I'm obviously, with the trust thing, maybe that can be avoided in, if you know about it beforehand. But saying that's already been done, what can we do about that kind of situation? With the breach of trust 
critical moment of neglectedness things, all you can really do is acknowledge them, attempt to rec- apologize for them, and it's an, a one-time sort of apology. You don't just keep apologizing for years and years and years for things you've already apologized for. Acknowledging them, apologizing for them, and attempting to fix whatever you can of the situation and go forward with hopefully not having the same thing happen again. That's about all you can do. Well, say your partner, she's still emotionally upset about this. And I know I've had this situation before. This doesn't really put an end to it. And then she's still, you know, you can feel it or sometimes it will come up in, in our arguments. So it'll keep coming back a bit. What happens there? As long as you've made a genuine apology and you've attempted to rectify what the situation is, that is all you can do. If they are going to continue on being emotional, upset, or whatever, at some point, it simply becomes on them to process whatever it is of the situation. The more you try and continue to pacify them, calm them down, appease them, whatever, almost invariably, the more justified they feel in continuing to be angry and upset with you. It can actually become almost a display of weakness to them. But yeah, ultimately, though, at some point, it's on them. You can only fix what you can fix, apologize for what you've done or could have done or should have done or whatever, and then it's up to your partner. At some point, they let it go. It's like a choice, I think, you have to give them ultimately. If you don't, It's like you said, we can either do some work on this and we can get over it, or we're going to split ways. I've seen a lot that when this trust gets broken... It can be irreparable in some relationships and you can work on it for another few years and it'll be not much fun. There's this point where you have to see, is this trust irreparably broken for this person? Are they not going to be able to get over it? Or is it worth putting a little bit of effort in here like, and we can probably get past it? You can give them some time. I mean, it does depend how bad the thing was that happened. But then if it's something that always is going to keep coming up and up and up and it's nine years later and the time your ex you accidentally sideswiped your car, still keeps coming up and she's still pissed or whatever. And it's like, you know, at some point, enough is enough. Either give it up or... So for some guys out there, say they're married or they're in a very long-term relationship and they just find the energy is not really there. How do they know if it's an alpha beta problem, as you described it earlier, versus a trust problem? If they're not really... Because some guys are like, I'm not sure what's going on here. Generally, the way I do it, it's starting off at the beginning to try and fix the alpha stuff because that's true no matter what. In the case of a guy that's been horribly betaized, I mean, if the guy is, say, 60 pounds overweight and he's just not going to be pulling her attention and attraction, obviously that's something that's got to be fixed. If then when you get to the point where he's doing things that are far more alpha and is doing a whole lot better with it and there's still some kind of weird blockage thing that he doesn't have any kind of explanation for, then I would really want to know, okay, so what is what is the backstory here of why she's just not responding? And sometimes the guy just has no clue, doesn't know even know what it was or has completely minimized it. It's actually really, really interesting sometimes with guys when I end up talking to the wives finally, and then they lay out some completely different scenario than the guy has laid out. So they're kind of the last straw. If you think you're being reasonable, you've got this alpha-beta balance, which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute, and you don't know of any trust issue there could be or any of these events that you're talking about that have come up, then is that a point where you say, okay, you've got to talk to her about it? Or what do you suggest in this scenario? We actually have to find out what it is. So yeah, or she may have already signaled it and he's not really paid attention to it. My point is, does he have to sit down and say, hey, I'm not sure about you, but I feel like the quality of our relationship has gone down the last year. And I have to say, I don't really know why. Start a conversation and then say, like, what what do you think? Like, this is what I feel, then what do you think? Well, even when I'm finding, coming across guys and and coaching them or talking to them or whatever, you have to almost look back at the whole relationship history. You're almost like you're analyzing a stock price or whatever. Like, okay, the stock was really, really high then, and then it kind of drifted down. And then it took that sharp dip five years ago. Then it was kind of stable. And then there was a sharp dip two years ago. And now it's kind of being stable. Okay, so what happened two years ago and five years ago? There's a lot of that I have to do in terms of like, okay, tell me this whole history. What happened five years ago? 
So, I mean, the guys can be struggling now. Someone comes to me and says, yeah, I I'm, I'm basically have a sexless marriage or it's you know once a month or whatever. And it used to be really good. It's like, so when did it stop being good? You know, when did it change? Is the sex or something you refer to? Is that one of the most prominent kind of signals? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Look, any long-term relationship or marriage is a, always a sexual relationship. It's I'm just chuckling here. What kind of benchmark should you consider yourself under? If you're having sex eight times a week, it's okay, I guess, right? But what kind of level should you be able to think you'd be a bit more worried? Or is it relative? Is it like if you've always had like sex twice per week and, and you know all of a sudden you're having once per month? It's relative. What I'm most interested in is when it changes. When does it change? If you've been going along and you've been having, say, sex four times a week, and then it suddenly just seems to dip to twice a week and then once a week, then when that is happening is the question of, like, what's up? All right. So look for the changes. Absolutely. Marriage is always a sexual relationship. It's either a good one or an indifferent one or a bad one. But even if you're in a, if someone guy has been married and has had no sex in the last three years, you still have to analyze it like it's a sexual relationship. Why is it? When did it go wrong? Okay. I just thought of a couple of situation kind of like confounders, uh, babies and the pill. If a girl's started to take the pill or maybe gone off the pill or she had a baby, I guess the sexual lifestyle can change a lot around those depending on hormonal changes and so on. Absolutely. Birth control, pregnancies, good pregnancies, bad pregnancies, major career changes, moving, death of parents, basically anything and everything that is a significant difference in your life or lifestyle can have some sort of dipping point. Right. So it's not all about the guy. I mean, you've brought up lots of external factors which could be influencing your marriage. Yeah. Some of them it can be completely external, but you still have to try and pick them when they happen. And unless you're really digging around for when it happened and why, you can, you can miss it. For example, there's a lot of women that have come to the forum or written me or whatever who have a marina IUD, have had a horrible tanking of their sex life, and then when they take it out, it comes back. Now, I'm not saying every single one of them is awful, but everyone that comes to me with it, this is the, you know, almost invariably, this is the factor. While the guy is like, yeah, I'm, I've, I've increased my health, I'm working out, I'm making more money, it's still dead. You know, why is... So there are other external factors you have to be aware of, just in case it's got, actually, isn't you in the relationship, it's actually something else. So you have to kind of look out for those variables in case it's something else you have to, might have to deal with. Talk about, basically. Exactly. Anytime it changes... You have to look at the sex life as like the canary in the coal mine. If it suddenly dies for no reason, even though you can't see why, you know there's something bad happening. Is it something related to you? Is it a job? Is it financial? Is it medication? I mean, the number of people that have had the relationship tank while one of their partner went on an antidepressant, that's huge as well. So you have to almost look at everything that goes on. It's not just whether you're talking and being alpha or beta or whatever. There's so many different things. Right. So anyway, let's go back to the alpha because I wanted to cover the alpha versus beta thing because obviously there's a lot of information about out there about being alpha, how to be alpha, how not to be beta. But when you're in a relationship, you know, obviously if you follow all of these the alpha stuff that's written down, it, eventually that's not going to work very well for you. So you've got this concept of balancing alpha with beta. How do you explain that and what's that about? Since I, I wrote that original book, it's almost, I've almost moved away slightly from the, the word balancing. Okay, how do you talk about it now? Give us the update. There's still the two separate traits, the, the alpha and the beta, but you almost don't get credit for the beta ones until you have the alpha one in place. You can do a whole ton of beta stuff that is actually good, but it's almost like you don't get credit for it unless you also have the alpha stuff in place for. So there is a balance in a sense of if you have some of each, you're doing better than missing one of them. But there is an element where it's alpha first, beta second. They're both required, but you don't get credit for the beta unless you have the alpha. A lot of things I see with guys is that will start correcting this quickly is they shotgun huge blasts of beta at the woman endlessly. I mean, they compliment her and they try and spend time with her and they touch her and they buy her things and they run around, you know, doing stuff for her and this giant shotgun blast of everything. 
And the truth is, she may only want one or two types of that. For example, Jennifer, she doesn't mind me buying her flowers. But if I bought them for her every day, she'd be like, what the, what is this? This is all too much, don't want. Whereas things for her, like hanging out, doing quality time and touch, she really, really likes. Likewise, if I complimented it all day 24-7, eventually she'd be like, enough. You know, this is all too much. It's almost like you're trying to serve someone five desserts when they really only want one, maybe two. Well, I think most guys can relate to this if they've ever had a clingy girlfriend. That sounds a little bit like a clingy type behavior. Yeah, like enough with the quality time. I, you know, need some space. So you have to find out what they truly relate to in terms of actually what they really enjoy and crave because they can still crave one but not some of the other stuff. And some of the other stuff you kind of cut away so you're not oversupplying stuff they don't actually want. Because, you know, anytime someone is doing a whole bunch of stuff for you, completely orbiting you, you almost start feeling obligated that you should be doing something in return to try and even up the score between the two of you. And that most women experience that as just kind of creepy and all too much, and it actually makes them less attracted. In terms of the alpha stuff, it's really just sort of basic relationship leadership and just sort of benign dominance. It's coming up with a plan of something to do. Let's go do this now. Let's go here. And not endlessly folding anytime there's some minor disagreement or minor testing. I think that's the biggest thing for the alpha stuff. And along with stuff like you know, fitness and dressing and having your sense of terms of what you want to do with your life and doing the stuff that you actually want to do rather than creating in your own mind some sort of putting you in second place to her or third place after the kids or fourth place after her, the kids and her mother or fifth after the all of those and your friends where you actually have your own sense of self-esteem and doing what you want to do. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It's a balancing act of sorts, but you really do have to have the alpha in place before you get the credit for the beta. Yeah, and I think there's a, an important thing you brought up is like, in terms of these beta behaviors, I mean, it sounds like you're just putting everything that's kind of nice or could be like a termed loving and, and so on, caring, these kind of things. And I think one of the things you brought up is that women can like different approaches with that as well. So in some of them don't maybe like you verbally complimenting them all the time, or they have specific areas where that's not really what they need. They prefer something else. Maybe they just like the touch. So I think that's, that's an important aspect you brought up there, which allows you to fit. And some of this is kind of natural, I think. You know, it's like when you get together with someone, you have a fit with them because you tend to be physical and she likes physical. So there's different aspects like that which tend to fit together. And they can be warning signs early on in the relationship. Also, if you're not fitting, if you tend to put your arm around her all the time and she's like, ah, oh, you know, that's a bit too much for me, then long term, that's probably going to be an issue if that's just something you kind of like to do you tend to do well in most i mean everyone likes to be loved but we also tend to express that sense of love in the way that we would also like to receive it back so it's a really common where guys are really really into physical touch and that's how they want to be loved they would love you know her to touch them all the time say but then they if they do the same to her she might like it to an extent but maybe some other stuff is what really connects why don't you ever say something nice about me? Well, I'm touching you all day, so why don't you feel loved? So I think that's really, that's really common too. And the biggest problem I see too with guys is they learn this stuff for the first time, especially if they've been really, really heavily beta-ized in their marriage or whatever. They tend to go the complete opposite direction and really, really cut away almost all the beta and then try and go just full-on alpha 24-7. And that works great. It looks, works really, really well for about three months, three to six months at the tops. And then eventually they do something that's um, not very kind. And then they assume that the wife is then pushing back on if you know, she's testing him when she complains he wasn't very nice to her or whatever. And then it can really intensify and that can even turn into some sort of critical moment of neglect or breach of trust or whatever. So there is a balancing act of sorts that you do need to be a aware of but yeah i've seen the full-on alpha recovery thing work really well for guys and then they screw it up because they miss the beta you, you do need both yeah it's great to hear that so uh winding up here a couple of questions i like to ask everyone 
And uh, the first one is, who besides yourself would you recommend for high quality advice in this area of dating, sex and relationships? So marriages, long-term relationships. I quite like um, Michelle Weiner Davis's stuff on um, boundaries and divorce busting. Your stuff is really, really good. I also like um, Dr. Bob Glover's stuff on No More Mr. Nice Guy. Very much into why that nice guy role can be so toxic. So I think those are really good. Underpinning of what a lot of what I read and kind of write about in terms of, okay, the alpha equals dopamine and the the beta equals oxytocin is um, Dr. Helen Fisher's work. She doesn't quite make that jump, though. She just talks about it from the pure biological sort of point of view. Some of her stuff is interesting, too. I have this kind of interesting hybrid role. Yeah, yeah. I've seen Helen Fisher. She's on my radar as well. So I've been looking to interview her on the show. I think she's got some great stuff also. That's cool to hear. So what would be your top three recommendations to help men get results as fast as possible in this area of their lives? It's almost sort of breaking it down then into Dr. Helen Fisher's three love system sort of stuff. The first one is they, if they're not physically fit, they've got to get to the gym and get that under control because that's really what's underpinning a lot of the wife's attraction and a lot of the things that we can teach them that just simply has no effectiveness at all when they're you know, overweight and unfit suddenly seems to work when they're in shape. The second thing is if your relationship's not going well and it's anything to do with your attractiveness, you've got to stop bitching about it and stop complaining that your partner is not responding to you the way you would like them to respond to you. Because ultimately, their attraction to you is not controllable by them. But you being attractive is controllable by you. So anytime you start bitching about your partner not responding the way you want, and it's something you can change about you, then it's the onus is on you to change it. And often stopping the complaining, the nagging, the whining, the, you know, where are my blowjobs? How come you won't do this? When are you going to initiate? Just stopping the endless yapping and nagging. Just stopping it can just decrease this negativity a whole lot. And then you get to work on you and change the things you need to do. The third thing is, especially in a long-term relationship, you have to see that for the most part, most people get into the relationship because both parties are attracted and interested in each other. And there's a predisposition to actually want this relationship to work. And especially by the time you're married and you have kids and finances and careers, there's so many sunk costs into the relationship. Your partner really, really wants it to work. Most people do not want to get divorced at all. They feel driven to it. So you have to accept that when the relationship is starting to break down, there's very often some underlying structural things that would need to change And some of those things are going to take time. I think that's some of the things that have taken years to develop and not going to take days to resolve. Some of them are really going to take a couple of months or years to change. I mean, for some people, truly working on the attractiveness means changing their career, getting a better job, losing a crap ton of weight. So some people going back to school, really, really big structural questions. So, I mean, there's things you can do in the short term, but some of of it is a long-term fix. Now, so what are my three things there? I just rattled them out, didn't I? Thank you. Thank you very much, man. <laughs> great, great, great suggestions there. And thank you for coming on the show, not only because uh, you've got some great advice here, but also because you're the first New Zealander on Dating Skills Podcast. <laughs> All right. No, thank you. Take control of your dating life today. Take one idea or one insight from today's episode and apply it today. Don't wait. Do it today. That's all it takes to change your life, step by step, episode by episode. Learn more about what I, Angel Donovan, and my team do at DatingSkillsReview.com. How we help men like you take control of their dating lives.